Right, time travel debugging. Good, uh, nice, nice turnout. Always uh, good to see. So I'm going to talk about uh, how we can basically debug a lot better using time travel debugging. Before I get started, so before you like read the abstract to this talk, who had heard of time travel debugging? Let's see a show of hands. Okay, so maybe like two thirds. And who tried it in any form? One, two, three. Like, okay, so like not even 10%, 5%. So about two thirds kind of had heard of it, one third coming to find out what it's all about, and uh, only a handful having tried it. Hopefully I'm gonna, if I do one thing today, I wanna persuade you to go away and try it, right? And you can, I mean, all else being equal, I want you to use the undo stuff, because it's awesome, but I don't really care, right? You can use any of the stuff out there, depends what platform you're on. There's open source tools, we'll talk about the different things that are available, and why you would want to, and, maybe, and a little bit of like how they work, and what they're good for and stuff. Ah, that is. Right, so let's just start. Most programmers spend most of their time debugging, right? I think that's a fairly uncontroversial statement, but I don't think it's something that we really acknowledge as an industry, right? How many lines of code can you type in and have it work first time? Like, maybe you're better than me, but five, 10, maybe, no? Yeah, how many lines of code can you change and have it work first time? I reckon that averages to way less than one, right? So, so yeah, it's like just humans aren't very good at programming. It's just too hard. You need too much level of precision, and the computer's doing billions of things every second, and when something goes wrong, trying to find out what went wrong is super hard. So, uh, well, someone put it much better than me. This, you, probably, you may know this quote. It's quite a famous quote from Brian Kernighan. Everyone knows that debugging is twice as hard as writing a program in the first place, so if you're as clever as you can be when you write it, how will you ever debug it? Now, I think what Kernighan is saying here is, like keep it simple and give yourself margin for error, you're probably not quite as smart as you think you are. But I think there's an interesting corollary of this as well, which is that debugability becomes the limiting factor in how good our code can be. Right? Whatever your metric for good, whether it's how fast it runs or how small it is or how quickly I can write it or how extensible it is, like pretty much any metric for good, if you can make it twice as debuggable, you can make it twice as good. And there's a lot we can do to make it a lot more debuggable. So what do we do to debug? There's lots of things out there, right? So maybe we use the dynamic checkers, Valgrind, address sanitizer, who uses those at least sometime? Okay, pretty much like the vast majority, good. Uh, you can use debugger, so GDB or IntelliJ. If so show of hands again, use debugger at least sometime. Okay, most people, who used the debugger in the last week? Who used the debugger last week? Okay, like half the people, that's about half the hands. So that's more than you, like these talks kind of self-select a bit, right, to really kind of buy a sample. In my experience, it's maybe not that many, but yeah, so people can use the debugger, dynamic logging, it's not so much in the C++ world, but kind of in microservices land, there's lots of stuff out there, Lightrun and, and their competitors for sort of funky dynamic logging stuff. Or you can just use printf, <laughs> right? Yeah, printf, yeah, show of hands, printf, yeah, oh, come on. If you're not putting your hand up, then I don't believe you. Uh, so, so why is that, right? Why do, we, why, do we just, why do most people debug most issues using printf? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. One is, I'm gonna say it, kind of just lazy, right? You have to think hard normally when you're programming. Add another printf, let it recompile, run again. You don't have to really think in the same way. It's kind of a natural, kind of if you know the thinking fast and slow, system one, system two, it's very much a system one automatic comfort zone activity. And this is a, from a few years ago now, but was quite kind of much repeated XKCD cartoon. So yeah, so the programmers are goofing about, this is obviously pre-COVID when people actually went to the office, but anyway, programmers are goofing about, what are they doing? They're compiling. Why is the code compiling? Because they added a printf, right? 99% of the time you recompile the code, that's why. Um, so it's kind of the programmer's version of just reading email in the office, right? It kind of makes me feel like I'm being productive, feel busy, but maybe I'm not. So that's one reason why people use printf. But it's not the only reason, right? There's also, that's the bad reason. There's also good reasons why people use printf, at least in the absence of time travel debugging, spoiler alert, right? But when we're debugging, basically we're trying to think how did that happen, right? So not like, <laughs> I don't mean how did that happen, or how did that happen? 
But what I mean is I've got expectations about what my program is going to do, and reality diverges from my expectations at some point. Right? And the process of debugging is to work out where did, well, actually, more, it's usually more like that, but the process of debugging is where did reality diverge? And if my computer is doing billions of things every second and I've got maybe millions of lines of code, that's super hard, right? It's kind of the ultimate needle in a haystack challenge. But at least with printf, it tells me what my program did. And that's really what I'm trying to understand, right? When I'm debugging, usually what happened. And actually, regular debuggers don't really do that, right? They tell you what's happening. They tell you what the program is doing right now, and then maybe you can go forward a line or run forward to a breakpoint, and then they tell you what's happening now. But they don't tell you what happened. Well, OK, with the exception of Backtrace. Backtrace gives you a bit of a clue about how I got here. I suspect that Backtrace is one of the most commonly used commands in GDB and features in debuggers, because it's the closest you get to what happened. But it's just a sliver of information of what happened, how I got here, right? It's just my immediate call site and the, pair and the immediate call sites thereof. And all kinds of things may have happened in, I mean, this could be, like this time here, between here and here, this could be a really long time, right? Um, and, and yeah, the longer it is, kind of the harder things are to debug. Do I have a slide on that? I can't remember. Uh, whoa, we just skipped forwards. Oh man, that's, yeah. <laughs> so we just go back. And, so uh, yeah, so trying to work out what happened, sometimes it kind of feels a bit like this, right? And uh, what we would like is to feel a bit more like this. He looks a bit more serene and cool. So this, I, I like this picture for, for time travel, by the way, because partly it's kind of like, you know, cool, cooler than uh, some of the other more modern stuff. But also, this is the original. This is H.G. Wells' um, The Time Machine. And in it, unlike a lot of the more, uh, it's kind of the first time travel science fiction, and unlike the more modern ones, uh, he doesn't go back and change things, right? And in modern, Almost every modern time travel sci-fi, they go, you go back and, and like change things and fix those mistakes that you made or whatever. And that's not really what time travel debugging is about. It's about observing. So just like H.G. Wells is time traveler, we're just going to go back and observe and see what really happened. We can't change the history because, you know, paradoxes and stuff, right? But I think, I think there are two things that make debugging, make bugs hard. So if I just go back a few slides here. So how long is it between diverging from expectations and me noticing, right? So if, if the, like, if I, I don't know, like just really stupid, like forget to check a pointer for null, and then it segfaults, I can load the core file up, I can see that the time between the bug itself, the bad line of code, and the symptoms, a crash, is very short, almost immediate, so that's quite easy to debug. If I've been a good programmer and I've littered my code with lots of assertions, then hopefully that's narrowed the window between the thing going wrong and me noticing, right? That's why assertions are such powerful things. And that's why the worst bug always is bad results, right? The thing ran to completion, just didn't give me the answer that it should have. Those are horrible. The other kind of dimension that makes bugs really hard is how deterministic are they? Right? If every time I run the program, it fails in exactly the same way, then I can kind of get to the bottom of it like reasonably easy. If you think of debugging as like you're putting a, a jigsaw puzzle together, and every time I run the program, I'm getting a new clue about what went wrong, and I'm getting a new kind of puzzle piece. And you know, sometimes when you get so sometimes when you get a crash report or a bug report, and it might be that inner loop debugging where I'm just, you know, I've written the code and it didn't work. Or it might be that, you know, I thought it was perfect and it's deployed to production and someone has, has sent a, a bug report. Sometimes you get the crash report, the log or whatever, and you look at it and you can go, ah, don't, I know what that is, right? But usually there's not enough information in that original crash report. And I need to run it again and get more information, right? Get more clues, run more experiments and get more clues. And if every time I run the program, it does a different thing, it maybe it fails in a different way, maybe it only fails one run in a thousand. If it's always doing, if the behavior of the program is different every time I run it, then it's really hard to keep running those experiments, right? Because every time I get a new jigsaw puzzle piece, it's for a different jigsaw. Right? And it's really hard to build a jigsaw that way. So 
This is why what we want is, the, is to have our debugger tell us really what happened, right? I think uh, before I get into that, I'm going to show just a little demo inside. So there's, I'm going to talk about the different things that are available soon. Um, but let me just show you what I mean, because only a few hands went up of people who have actually tried it. So let's look at what this, what this really looks like. I'm just going to use GDB. I have here a program. So I'll show you the code. Hang on. Uh, so like the code isn't important, right? But it's just a bubble sort. It gets some, ran gets some numbers, random numbers, and then sorts them. And if I run it, it's not printing any output, but it is usually working. But I happen to know if I run this in a loop. <laughs> OK, it failed first time that time. Uh, and you get the point, right? So it, like, it's intermittent. Um, and uh, it's quite intermittent. It was very strange to fail on the first iteration of that loop. But anyway, um, so let's, OK, so we've got a core dump. So uh, yeah, there it is. So let's load that into GDB. And what did we say? Backtrace is usually what we do. Uh, no information. Can you read that? Is that too? F or maybe I'll um, let me uh, make fewer. Whoa, <laughs> that's like really fewer lines. Uh, let me do it like this, and then I can move this up to the top. Okay, that's probably a bit better, right? Um, wasn't just to get the logo in, I promise. Uh, <laughs> right, uh, yeah, so it's that, that core file is not very useful, right? So the information I need is gone from the universe. It's not in that core file. I do not have enough information to diagnose that. So I'm going to run the program inside GDB, and I'm going to use GDB has inbuilt time travel debugging. It's called process record, and it almost works. Um, and it works. Well enough, it works well enough to like have a play with and experiment what you're doing. It works well enough that if you've got a specific small piece of code and it's really not clear what on earth is going on, then actually it can be quite useful there. But the problem is that the slowdown is too bad and it also doesn't, it's not very well maintained, so it doesn't work great on modern CPUs and stuff. But it works well enough to show a demo, works well enough to have a play. Uh, so I am going to, I'm going to start the program. I'm going to put a proper bake breakpoint on main, and I'm going to use the commands command, which, if you don't know, in GDB, let's specify some GDB commands we're going to run every time that breakpoint is hit. And so the first thing I'm going to say is record, and the next thing I'm going to say is continue. And I'm going to put another breakpoint on exit, and I'm going to hang some commands of that, well, one command of that, which is to run. So if it gets to exit, remember the program seg faults. so if it gets to exit, it will just rerun, and then it will hit main, and it will turn on recording, and it will rerun. I'm just going to set pagination off and set confirm off because that messes everything up. And I'm going to run. And this is going to run. You can kind of see how slow it is, right? This is a, oh, OK, that, oh, so very nice. This is intermittent and crashing quickly. Usually it takes much longer. So this is, this is now, actually doesn't, doesn't say seg v hit, but should do, but it's a bug. It, but um, so now I can backtrace. Looks much the same as before, right? It's garbage backtrace. So Looks like I've got some kind of stack corruption. So, well, time travel means, as well as stepping forwards in time and running forwards in time, I can just go backwards. So I'm going to do the smallest increment of time travel that I can do. I'm going to go back one instruction in history. And well, actually, before I do that, I'm going to go layout source. Actually, no, that, I'm going to go TUI enable. That's a bit clearer. TUI mode, if you don't know as much, uh, lets me see what I'm debugging. Uh, who uses TUI mode when they use GDB? Oh, not many. Who's, who's heard of TUI mode? OK. Like, right, not very well known. So TUI mode makes GDB uh, suck a lot less. Actually, GDB is really good. But, but TUI mode makes GDB suck a lot less. It's like a poor person's IDE. Anyway, I've got no source available because of like, the things in hyperspace. Uh, reverse step I is going to go back one instruction. Like I said, the smallest amount of time travel that I can do. OK, and now look, I'm back. Well, this kind of isn't too surprising, because uh, I've, it looks like my return, I'm, I'm uh, stack corruption, right? I could kind of tell that from the core file. Uh, so let's see what's going on here. So stack pointer is that. 
Um, so this is x86. It's just running on my laptop. So x86 is a fully descending stack. So it means what's at the top of the stack should be the return address. So let's have a look at that. So that apparently is a return address, which doesn't look very addressy. Um, if I do the x command, that lets me examine memory at a given address. And yes, can that, mem that address doesn't exist. So all right, so the top of my stack contains garbage. And uh, so this is never a nice piece of you know, thing to happen as a programmer. So why did that happen? So I want to ask the program, or ask the debugger to tell me, how did I get here? What happened? And in particular, I want to know what line of code most recently wrote to that address, because that's probably what I care about, right? So I'm going to use a watch point here. Um, well, before I do that, uh, there's another bug stroke in Felicity. You have to turn hardware watch points off. Details don't matter. Um, uh, so now I'm going to put a watch point on that. I'm going to do a location-based watch point. So I'm going to look for that uh, specific address. I don't want to watch the expression. I want to watch the piece of memory that's be, that I'm specifying here. OK, so I set this watch point. OK, now I reverse continue. So I'm going to go back in time until the top of the stack changes, until the line of code that wrote to the top of the stack. OK, here I am. Now, somewhat unsurprisingly, I'm at some array, right? What's going on? Print i. i is 35. What is array? Array is 32 elements long. And so here's the stupid bug, but it's the classic percent size of array and size of is bytes rather than number of elements. So obviously, a very small program. Uh, and actually, you could just run address sanitizer or Valgrind, and it would also find this issue. But for everyone who, as we, as we know, with think, I mean, like you should. This, I don't see time travel at all as a alternative to things like address sanitizer or Valgrind. In fact, they work really well together, particularly with address sanitizer, because with simple bugs, all the, like, this is a stupid little demo, which fits in, you know, on a single slide with decent font size. Um, but real world bugs. Well, there's the type that are kind of obvious, and you can figure it out from the crash or from the what address sanitizer tells you. But the thing that we spend all the time, the thing that really dominates, is the ones where it's kind of a chain reaction, kind of a bit like every single you know airplane disaster is is like multiple things that go wrong that lead to it. Those are the ones that take all the time. And so often, address sanitizer tells us, yeah, there's something wrong here. You're accessing this out of bounds or something. And it's like, well, why is that? Out? Why am I doing that out of bounds access? I've, access via some index, and that index should always be within bounds, right? So address sanitizer has given me a clue. If I then run that with time travel with some kind of recording, then I can just go back to see why that index is wrong, right? So these things complement each other, work very well together. So that's just the simplest, shortest demo of what time travel debugging is. It just gives the debugger the ability to answer the question, what happened? OK, very quickly. So when, when, when would you use this? So the most obvious thing I think most people think of most of the time when they first see this is, I'm going to run this in production. Because those are the bug reports I get that I just can't fix. I don't have enough information. I don't have enough information in the logs. Now, you can do this in production. And people do. People use our stuff and the other stuff in production. But there is a slowdown when you're recording, right? Uh, nothing is for free. It depends what you're using, so the GDB inbuilt process record is like, I think it's like 100,000 times slowdown. Uh, other tools, our stuff, RR, the TDD, we'll talk about the different tools that are available. They run much more like half speed or there or thereabouts, OK? So some depends what you're doing in production. Sometimes that will work, sometimes it won't. Most people in production, they run it when they, it's like, ugh, it did it again. That's the third time this week. Right? Now I'm going to enable recording, perhaps in some subset of production, and try and capture it. And then I capture it, and then I've got it. But that's only one. That's kind of usually that's the end of the journey, right? That's no, no, nobody really starts time travel debugging there. Much better to start with in your CI, right? Jenkins test, your test fails, rerun the test with recording, get the recording file. Or oh, I know this test is flaky. I mark it flaky. I'm just going to run that all the time in some flaky test with a recording enabled until recordings kind of sort of poop out of my of my system, and then I can time travel debug those. It's really good for flaky failures. But actually start with the inner loop development, right? That thing we just said at the beginning. You type in some code, doesn't work. Why? 
get a recording, load it into the time travel debugger if it's not immediately obvious. OK, uh, that's the first part of the talk, like what it is. Uh, show of hands, who is convinced to immediately go back and try this? How many have I got? I've completely failed in my, OK, there's more. I'm just going to guilt you into it, right? There's a lot of people stubbornly got their hands down. OK, why not? Someone, someone tell me from the audience, what? Well, yes? Very, very slow. Can you, def can you kind of quantify how slow? Um, you yeah. So with well, okay, so the RR that's a surprise. It doesn't you? I mean, it, you, like your mileage will vary, but regular GDP no recording is going to take you five. Uh, okay, that's a surprise. Why? What's what's leading to that slowdown? Is it like the time it spends? Because when you run in GDP, it's normally going to run pretty much unencumbered, right? Yeah. So just the time. So can we kind of quantify this? So how long are you having to wait for LLDB to open the binary and get you in there? Are we talking like 30 seconds, three minutes? No, 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 it's like five minutes? Five minutes. So it's just, just enough friction for you not to do it. Yeah, yeah. OK. Uh, yeah. It was, so modern, particularly modern GDBs should be a lot quicker. I mean, I don't know how big your binary is. Obviously, you know, your mileage will vary. But, but new, the newest versions of GDBs, are, are, they have multi-threaded um, uh, debug info parsing and stuff, and they'll load much quicker. But OK, you're too impatient to load the debugger. Uh, but you don't actually count as probably answering, because you've already tried it, right? So I want to know, some, I wanna know somebody else who's like, they've never tried it, and they're not convinced now that it's worth trying. Anyone brave enough? Because of the slowdown. Yeah. Can't really run it. In, can't really run it in production. Yes. No, but it could. <laughs> oh, I, fa I failed so badly. Well, okay, but but this is good. Like, kind of like an, uh, this is a, an honest, open conversation. So you'd rather just add the print statements and hope, because because well, you think that's going to get you there quicker. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. OK. But how many times, I, mean, I don't want to get into like an a, like argument over this. So it's, OK, so you're concerned about the, the runtime slowdown. You think, although I'd say, if, it's, if, it, if your mileage will vary, but if it's running at half speed with the recording, you only need to save one rerun cycle and your parity, and that assumes zero debug, zero uh, compile time. OK. Do you know what I mean? If I run it, oh, OK, now I need to add a printf and run again. Well. And now, so I didn't need to do two runs to get my answer. And often, as we all know, actually, we had another printf and another printf and another printf. But let's say it's just two or three. OK, but see, now you're going production. And I agree. Right? So this is the thing, right? So people see this, and they, go, they immediately think production. Don't start in production, right? Because that's the heart. That's where, like, you can do it. People do it all the time. It's super powerful. But you really kind of, that's the advanced usage. And you need to know when, because it doesn't make sense, absolutely doesn't make sense in all scenarios. But more when you kind of, you know, ever have to debug a flaky test? Test fails one run in 100? No? Doesn't happen? OK. All right. Well, you, uh, wow, no, never have any flaky tests? <laughs> OK. I wish I were you. Can That's you cool. Yeah. OK. Yeah. OK. Yeah. You might want some more stress tests, I think. That might be the verdict there. OK, but that seems to be, that's the thing I most commonly hear, actually, is concern about the runtime overhead. And uh, I think, as I said, just like, it all depends on the, on, on, on the scenario. But if you, yeah, if it slows down by 2x, you save, you just do it in one cycle rather than two printf uh, cycles and you're ahead, right? And we all know it often takes a lot more than two. Um, Right, OK, I don't want to come on forever and ever on that. Uh, we're going to just show some more real-world demos. We've got until 5, haven't we, in this? We, we've got a bit of time. So I'm going to get into a bit of, like, what are the different options to do this and how does it work. I'm going to assume that... 
I'm going to assume that actually everybody is going to go ahead and try this straight after this talk, and I didn't actually fail as badly as I did. Right, so that's the wrong button again. Okay, so I think, I think this is an idea and a technology whose time has come, essentially, and there are a number of uh, solutions out there, and a lot of people are doing this um, like, yeah, in, you know, in production and in tests and all the rest of it. And it depends what platform you're on. So if you're, if you're writing, I'm you know, this is a C++ conference, so I'm assuming most it's C++. So if you're writing on Linux, like regular kind of, uh, you know, uh, kind of servers and, 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 and regular, you know, rather than imbe deeply embedded. You've got our stuff, which is wonderful. Um, you've got RR, which stands for record and replay, which is completely open source. You can just download it and use it. A little bit limited in like where it can run, but if it will run, it's very good. And I'll talk a bit about the trade-offs in a bit. GDB, which you've seen, ish, kind of. It's kind of good for play, but probably not really good for, for real-world serious stuff. Windows has something called, imaginatively enough, Microsoft love their unimaginative acronyms. Windows has something called TTD, time travel debugging, which you can run inside WinDBG, and uh, it, it's, it's really good, and it works really well. And Microsoft themselves use it a lot for their own debugging of their own applications, Office and SQL Server and those kind of things. Um, there's some sniggering, like maybe they need to use it more, I don't know. If you're embedded, you're running like on an RTOS or directly on the hardware, then you kind of need, uh, need some hardware support. So Lauterbach and uh, Greenhills both have uh, these kind of devices that you can plug into your JTAG and they use, as long as you've got the appropriate support in the CPU, like the embedded trace macro cell of its arm, will, um, uh, will give you that time travel experience without any operating system. But if you, do, if you have an operating system, then, then uh, you don't need any of the fancy hardware. And you can, well, unless you're Mac, in which case uh, you should just uh, write a letter to Tim Cook, I suppose. They don't um, right. Actually, there's loads and outside of C++ as well. This is a C++ conference, but lots of us write in different languages as well. So I thought, for completeness, if you're doing... Oh, I oh, just pressed the button again. Oh, thanks, Chris. Yeah, back. If you're doing uh, JavaScript, or particularly React, there's a company called Replay.io, which are kind of specializing in that. There's um, on .NET, there's a couple of solutions, including Microsoft's own, also a company called RevDebug. On Java, there's our stuff. Rust and Go uh, can be, be we, we can do that as uh, undo as can uh, as can RR. So uh, kind of lots of different kind of combinations of things. Uh, also the other Java kind of JVM type languages like Scala and things like that will also work in uh, undo. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the history of this. As it is an idea, as time has come. Actually, if you look back, there's countless research papers and like countless PhDs certainly going back over the decades that have tried to implement something like this. I've met many people over the years who've built something at their PhD or sometime like that. Um, kind of experimental systems, but it's only recently in the last five to ten years that it's become, I think, ready for prime time, as they say. This was the first one that I saw, a thing called the Omniscient Debugger. Um, see the date stamp at the top there, 2006. This is the first time I saw it. I saw the concept. Um, it instruments the JVM it's not super scalable, but it actually worked reasonably well. Um, and when I first saw that, like, yeah, my you know, mind was blown. Could immediately see, wow, now the debugger can tell me what happened. Um, uh, so, yeah. So we want to know the, the, the. So this is the question, right? What happened? And if I'm going to answer that in a in a debugger sense, then a kind of more precise way of saying that is, what was the previous state of my program? Right, because what I want, with, what I can do with these time travel debuggers is I can go back. Just think about this. I can go back to any line of code that executed, and I can see any piece of program state at any point in history. Like there's nothing about my program's execution that I can't just see. It's, like, it's a colossal amount of information. So clearly, I'm not going to capture every single previous state. That's way too inefficient. Uh, even if I just try and capture just the delta, just like what changes, that's also problematic, just because billions of operations every second. But basically, I've got two ways that I can do this. I'm not going to store the complete program state for every instruction that executes. That's just madness. Um, but I'm gonna, if I'm going to try and st just store the, the, the deltas even, then, um, like I say, that is, that is, that is uh, 
just too much information. So I can, that's why I moved. But if I want to go back and I want to see what happened, I can save it, uh, save each state transition, or I can try and recompute it. It's better to try and recompute, right? Trying to figure out what the previous states were. But that's harder than it first sounds. Because if I've got a statement like this, that is inherently reversible. If I know the value of A after that statement executed, I can deduce the value of A before the statement executed, right? It's not hard. But I can't here, right? Sorry for those back, I can't necessarily just see the lines. If I just got a straight assignment, A becomes B, right? Well, and now I know the value of A after that executes, the value of A is 42, what was it before? I have no way of knowing, right? That universe, that, that information does not exist in the universe anymore. So we can't run computers backwards. I mean, there's some interesting research with reversible logic and kind of what that might mean does interesting things to actually turns out to be really efficient in terms of power consumption because there's a sort of, when you destroy information that actually consumes energy. Anyway, that's not for this decade. Uh, so I can't run computers backwards. So if I'm gonna deduce what that was before, there is another way uh, to recompute it, which is to rerun it, right? I can periodically snapshot, and then I can go back to a preceding snapshot and run that to like just before where I am then that will have the illusion of going back in time. I can get to any point in my program's execution just by going through to a preceding snapshot and running it to the right place. Now that's what, that's what undo, that's what we do at undo with Live Recorder, that's what an UDB, that's what uh, RR does. Uh, it's not quite what the Microsoft TTT does, it's what replay.io does. Um, and you can, you can, you know, especially on Linux, you can just use fork to get nice copy on write semantics of the program state. Uh, there are a sort of equivalents in Windows that, that, that TTT does. So it can be very efficient to create those snapshots, but we're not creating very many of them. We only need to create the snapshots kind of human scale, like every second or something. In fact, once it's been running for a while, we don't even need to record them every second. We might record them every hour and then kind of post-process and fill in the snapshots. Well, the snapshots are just an optimization, right? I really only need the starting state and then I can rerun the program because computers are deterministic things, right? When I run the same program multiple times with the same starting state and the same inputs, it will always do the right thing, okay? So computer programs are deterministic, obviously, except when they are not. And in practice, like they usually aren't, otherwise you wouldn't ever need to read it, run it a second time. So I need to, what I need to do to make this work is capture the sources of non-determinism and replay them synthesize them, reconstruct their side effects at the right points as I replay, and then I can make the replay do exactly what happened the first time round. Um, so I store these events in an event log, uh, and this is kind of the basic architecture for most of the modern uh, time travel debugging implementations. This is like basically how you make it scale. And it does scale, by the way, right? So our stuff is, and as I said, you know, Microsoft run it on SQL Server and other big stuff like that. Um, whoops, I went too far again. It doesn't matter. We can, um, there we go. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, our customers routinely run on programs that are like uh, hundreds of gigabytes uh, in working set and run sometimes for days, right? This totally scales, and it only scales using this kind of technique, and this is what the, 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 the modern versions do. Um, the other thing that I think is quite interesting is... Uh, is that, no, oh, geez, I, for, there we go. I, uh, I did have a proper clicker thing, I left it at CppCon, and I haven't managed to get one since. Um, right, yes, so what are we gonna store? When we say we're gonna snapshot the program, what exactly are we snapshotting, um, and how are we gonna capture the information that we need to capture it? There's kind of different ways that you might do this, particularly if you're gonna work, I mean, in C++, it's a bit more obvious that you would work at the, process level, but it actually turns out to be the best way to do it regardless. But so here's my really simplified, right, I've got kernel and I've got processes running on the kernel, right? This is like pretty, uh, shouldn't be super interesting. And what I'm gonna capture in my recording is around this process boundary, right? So basically all of these work at user level, they're not capturing the kernel, apart from if you use the embedded stuff from Lauterbach or Greenhills, but if you use software implementations, they're all user space and they're capturing that process boundary, like including libc and you know, other system libraries, they, they live inside the process, 
And it's everything between like the process and the kernel ABI. That's, what, that's what's being captured. And it turns out that's a good way because we can make certain guarantees about, you know, this is my address space, and I know that nothing is going to change that address space like from outside, right? Unless it's the memory is marked shared or it's async IO. There's exceptions that we have to deal with, but in the simple case, in the simple case, I know that I've got guarantees about only the program, a program's memory, a process's memory can only be changed by the process itself, right? Or some other entity that it's given permission to. So we just capture everything, like right? yeah, libc and, and everything down to the OS ABI. And you can capture other processes, you can capture all the processes or some of the processes or just one process. It doesn't matter, we're capturing at the process level. Um, and we need to reconstruct everything that's like unpredictable, right? So the reason this works, the reason we can re-execute from a snapshot is, yeah, if I add two numbers together and I've got the same state of the program, I'm going to get the same result, right? I better had, otherwise everything is going to go kind of screwy. I'm, I'm even going to get like the same flags are going to be set in the flags register and everything else. But there are some things that are not predictable based on the state of the program, most notably system calls. Like if I could predict the system call based entirely on the state of the program, then it shouldn't be a system call, it should be a library call, right? So we need to intercept all the system calls at record time and record their results. If I read from the file system, we intercept that read and we capture the read in what was read into the event log when we're recording and then when we play, we can, re we can kind of reconstruct that. Uh, thread switches and thread interactions, clearly they're unpredictable. They run the same multi-threaded program multiple times. Even with the same inputs, it might do different things. Uh, asynchronous signals and other events, right? So I get a sig alarm come in, that can happen at any time. Any shared memory accesses, right? So only the program, any, a program's memory can be changed only by itself unless it's arranged otherwise and it's got shared memory shared with another process, shared with the, shared with the OS. So most memory holds the property that when I read from it, what I read is what I most recently wrote. The shared memory does not hold that property, right? So we need to record at least accesses to shared memory where it changed under our feet. And certain machine instructions. So on x86, read the timestamp counter is not predictable given the state of my program, right? There's also instructions now to get a random number. Equally, obviously, not predictable. Actually, you could say that a system call is just an example of a machine instruction whose results are not predictable. I've taken system call out as a separate case, but in some ways, it's a special case of an unpredictable instruction. But if I do those, at least on Linux, if I do those, then that's it. I can get perfect reconstruction of any program that executes. So, but there's a, there's a, a bunch of different uh, tools out there, and they all make kind of slightly different uh, design trade-offs. So I just want to go through some of that before we get into some more meaningful demos. Uh, so, um, yeah, we've got these design decisions, right? So what boundary to capture? Do we do it at the process level or something else? Because if you're doing something for Java, you might think better to do that at the JVM level, right? Um, and, uh, and, and, and so on. So here's, this is not exhaustive, but this table is some of the more widely used. ODB is that omniscient debugger. Um, I put that on the end as a kind of comparison point that didn't really scale. So if you look at this, at what boundary to capture, all of them apart from ODB capture at the process layer, even surprisingly replay.io. So if you haven't seen replay.io, very cool company, and it's all about Java, Script, uh, particularly React, uh, re time travel debugging of web applications, right? And, and, and it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of counterintuitive that they've they found the best boundary to capture it is at the process level. And they actually have a modified version of Firefox, and they've got a modified version of Chrome as well now, which will kind of hard, hard code those non-deterministic things and do the interception for them, but they basically capture at the browser level not even just for your little JavaScript thing that's like deep inside the browser. They capture the whole browser execution because that, it turns out, is the only sane way to do it. Like build, by the way, there's a sort of irony. Building these systems, they are like some of the most difficult to debug systems you can have themselves, right? Uh, at least until the point where you can eat your own dog food because they just, if you, if you get it wrong when you're replaying the execution, if you get that just a little bit wrong, so it diverges from the originally recorded state, it can be a long time before you notice. And that other dimension is kind of inherently in a non inherently non-deterministic. So, so super hard to debug. And so you need to be able to really reason about the system. And the process boundary 
allows me to do that. The sandbox my JavaScript runs in inside my browser, it's like totally messy, right? And it's totally vulnerable to any browser bugs or anything that the developers just decide to like reach in and change this piece of state or any you know, calls to and from the DOM or anything like that. So they do it at the, at the process boundary as well. Uh, as a kind of big kind of design decision around whether you want binary rewriting instrumentation. So, uh, so we do that, and, and the Microsoft platform, I don't know why I called it WinDBG, but anyway, the Microsoft Time Travel Debugger platform does that. So you don't have to modify the code. You don't have to recompile it in a special way. Uh, you, oh, for God's sake. This is actually a really bad clicker. I think I just press, press back. So I think if you do forward. <sighs> oh. I'm going to buy a new clicker. I've decided to hell with the expense. Um, yeah, so um, so we do this binary rewriting instrumentation on the fly. Microsoft does the same, so you don't need to recompile in any special way, and you don't need any special hardware. Um, uh, Replay.io did it differently. They, as I said, they modified the browser, right? So they've done it kind of statically. Um, RR doesn't use that. It use, RR uses uh, performance counters on the CPU. Because the other hard thing you've got, as well as capturing, intercepting those non-deterministic things, when you replay, you have to replay those non-deterministic events at exactly the right time, like down to the instruction level. So let's say an asynchronous signal comes in. Let's say a SIG alarm comes in. I've got to replay that SIG alarm at it, like exactly the right point. Otherwise, my program is liable to diverge. So I need this super fine control of time. Uh, and so you can do that basically in two ways. You can do that with binary rewriting instrumentation, or you can do it uh, by, uh, um, by uh, using the program counters on the CPU, right? So the performance counters on the CPU tell you how many instructions you've executed or how many branches you've done, which is kind of enough um, to figure it out. The problem with that approach is that they are not generally, they're not universally available. Right, so if you just get a machine off AWS or something, it probably doesn't have the performance counters available because, you know, um, it, I think partly for security reasons, the you know potential for for site for these side channel attacks, um, and partly because a lot of the hypervisors just haven't implemented it, um, uh, and it does mean you can only capture certain things. Like so, shared memory is out. So um, by that with that approach, you can't uh, you haven't got enough information to do to monitor the shared memory accesses. I could do a whole other talk about how uh, time travel debuggers support shared memory, but uh, we don't have time. Um, so do they allow shared memory accesses? So um, well, as in, do they record every single shared memory access, or some of them, or none of them? And so RR can't record uh, any. Uh, WinDebug will record pretty much all, although there is some. So uh, turns out that even Microsoft don't know in enough detail what the ABI is between the Windows kernel and uh, user space to uh, reliably intercept all of the system calls. So they just protect, they just act as though all of the memory is shared. Any of it may change at any time. Um, and then another design decision, which you might see in a, in a bit, is that, do you have separate record and replay phases? So I haven't shown um, in the, the inbuilt GDB stuff in this table. Perhaps I should. And that doesn't require separate record and replay phases. Uh, uh, our interactive debugger called UDB for the undo debugger, that doesn't require separate phase. You can just like attach to a running program and then you know, do what you want to do. Um, all of the others have a kind of separate record phase, and then you load that recording in and debug it later. Um, and sometimes I wish we'd done that, because it's like it does uh, remove a lot of the challenges. It's a lot easier to implement. We do have that option. You can do that using the undo stuff, using live record as a kind of headless record. But, um, uh, but you don't have to. Um, so uh, anyway, these are just kind of like some of the different design decisions around uh, the different platforms. I think that takes us to demo time. So we're going to swi quickly switch the, uh, cable switch the cable over. And Greg's left me lots of time for this. That's there, you can hear me, hopefully. Yeah. So I, get, I can get rid of this. Okay. So on the screen, but everyone's eyesight is absolutely perfect, right? Yeah. Okay. Let's maybe not go for crazy eyesight requirements. Let's make this a bit bigger. So, 
We've seen the, the, the simple demo in the um, bubble source example that Greg gave earlier with GDB. Um, pardon? I can hold it closer, but then it's going to be a lot harder to type. We'll see how we go. Okay, so... Uh, you could try this thing. Uh, we'll, we'll go for this for the moment, because uh, hopefully it'll be more typing and less peaking. Um, okay, so I've taken... The, uh, we decided that we'd actually try and show you a, a demo on a real-world application rather than an artificial, simple thing, and Greg has generously left me lots of time to do this, so yay. Um, but I decided... We did some exploration a while ago, looking for some examples of these the demos that would make sense and speak to people. SQLite, wonderful project. Lots of people use it every day, most of the time not knowing about it because it's in everything. Um, but this is an example of an issue found where an integrity check complains that the database um, has a discriminatory function. Ah, that will be perfect, thank you. I'll give this to you and I'll stand here while I talk about it. So essentially, We've got a, a, a bug in the bug tracker. We've got the ultimately we see the database disk images malformed error come out. Um, I. Online, assuming I wasn't going to have the time to do it, even though it only takes about a minute and a half, uh, I already downloaded it, I did the configure, I did the make, and then we can have a look at the LS, and I can run it. And I've already taken the um, SQL from the website. So if I pipe that in, we run that, we do indeed see the error. So this is the, um, the 3.30.0 release of the code downloaded, replicated. We've replicated the bug, wonderful. Uh, so, headless record. Let's do this. Greg mentioned it earlier, how we do record separately. If I do live-record, um, dot slash SQLite. Uh, yes, certainly, sorry. So, hopefully that's legible, or just a massive mess of text. Um, if I do it again, and this time I pipe in the command. For those who didn't see it the first time, you see we've got the database disk image of our form there. Is that legible? I did it. Right. It's too low. Okay. Well, when I press enter, it'll come higher up. <laughs> okay. Um, so we did it the first time. Now I've recorded it. Um, I'm going to use a mouse. But at the top, you can see there's going to be a recording saved. It gets saved to that file. We see the error come out. And then the bottom is just saying, we're going to save it. We've saved it. We're detached. And then edit. So those who can't see the bottom lines, don't worry too much. I'm going to switch to an IDE, and there's not a lot in that bottom left corner. Unfortunately, there is some typing at the bottom of the screen, so I might drag that up. But if I just do an LL-OIH, uh, you can see we've got these recordings here, they're 17 megabytes to record this. And this is now the repeatable uh, recording. If we switch over to Visual Studio Code, which I'm going to use for this, I told you I had the issue, so these are the commands that we saw. Again, let's make this a bit bigger. Okay, that might be a little clunky. So we've got our code here. Um, the, S the code for SQLite is actually shipped in two rather large source files, and we'll see that in a second. But with the plugin installed, I have the option to replay a recording. So I'll just start with playing that. Um, and then it'll offer me to choose the recording. Uh, let's choose the one that I just made, which would be uh, this one today. So it's loading the recording. Um, and with time travel debugging, Generally speaking, we go to the end of the recording because that's sort of where the interesting thing happens. Although in this instance, the code did just exit quite happily. It reported the error and then it terminated in a normal fashion. So our f the first thing we're going to be wanting to do is how do we get back to where things interesting were happening? And I'm going to suggest that this integrity check function is what caused the fault. So if I take that string and copy that, Look in the source code. Um, if I look in shell.c, uh, there's, there's no results. It seems to take a look, I've done it before. Um, so there's no result for that. So we'll look in sqlite.c. 
the left, and we'll find there are two instances in here. I'm just going to make this a bit bigger, hopefully. And so if I go to the first one, you can see if the string integrity like is in the command, then it's going to call this, this function. So let's put a breakpoint here, and we'll just set the second instance. Again, if the string integrity like is there, then we're going to call this function as well. So we'll put the breakpoint there. So we've got breakpoints in the past for where the integrity chunk function is, and now I can just run backwards. Um, I'm not going to, I'll explain them a little as I get to them, but we have backwards buttons as well as forwards buttons at the top. So this is just reverse continue. And here we are at this point. We can see we're before the function's called. So RC, which I'm going to guess is return code, um, is zero. Uh, if I look down here, I can see that zero is the OK return code. So if I just step over this function, we can see RC is 267. OK, so that's not OK. And since we know what OK is, if I right click and peek, oh, it's over here, peek definition. We can scroll down a little bit, see um, actually here, SQLite -like corrupt is uh, 11. Um, well, 267 is 256 plus 11. Um, so if we scroll down a bit further, we can see you know, we've got an SQLite -like corrupt VTAP. So we found the error code. That's quite likely to produce the integrity error result we saw. Um, so now I want to know, well, where has that come from? If I go back here. So I'm here after the function call that's just returned this bad value or this error code, let's go back into it and see why it did it. Um, if I start stepping over, I can see it's 267 here. Step back a bit more. Hopefully this is legible at the back. I'm sorry if it isn't, but there's only so big I can make the text before we're not able to see what's going on. Um, so yes, RC is 267. Let's step back again. Okay, it's now zero. So this function call is where it happens um, because we can go backwards, I'm going to go forwards and go backwards into it. And if we go back again, we can see here, RC is still 267, but actually, it's a very simple function. This is pulling it out of this data structure. So if I step back over here, um, at this point, the return code is that, but this is the value where it actually came from. So that's what I want to find. When was this set? Um, I'll do this the quick way. Um, we have a button up here, so last change. This is going to basically allow me to set the watch point. We saw Greg demonstrate this earlier, but in this code, setting the watch point on this value with 267, press enter, and we run backwards to here where we detected this, and FTS5 corrupt. If I hover over that, is it gonna tell me what it is? That's 267, peak at its definition. Uh, it's taking its time. Um, we'll ignore this for now. It'll probably catch up in a minute. Um, but we can start looking at what's going on here. So we're in our integrity check code. But this is good. We're looking at our table. Um, I'm not hugely familiar with the SQLite code. I know what this error is because I have done this before. This isn't the first time. I'm not that crazy to try and do this live <laughs> without seeing it. Um, but essentially, let's have a, a quick look at what's going on. Ah, thank you. You've been really helpful. So basically, it's a define, and it's to the corrupt VTAP value. It got there eventually. Um, so what we're doing is if I off plus n byte is greater than p leaf dash size leaf. Everyone knows what that means, right? <laughs> OK. Um, let's look at this a little bit more. I off, offset, maybe integer, that's great. Um, n byte, well, n byte is really defined just above. We can see IOF is being incremented by some value. We have a get varint 32. So that's going to get a variable width integer. Um, this is probably a macro. I don't really care. Um, it's going to read from the current offset at the time. At the moment, it's saying 4. If I were to step back to that, um, then we'd see that the IOF was 3 at the time. So we, it takes one byte uh, to read it, and it's going to read it into n byte. So if I step over again, we can see n byte is 11. So we've read that. We've got I off is 4, n byte is 11. So that's probably telling you what the size of the next element in the data structure is. Uh, on the right-hand side, p leaf. OK. Well, we can see size leaf is 11. Um, p leaf is uh, FTS5 data. Let's just have a quick peek at its type definition. Hopefully this one's faster. No, not. Uh, unhelpful. This is a problem when you've got 200,000 lines of code. It's like it's not designed to help you debug it. Um, 
but I can hover over this and we can see P leaf um, is uh, pointing to the leaf element in the data structure. The size leaf is one of the elements. Um, fortunately, this hover over is telling me what it is. We have a pointer to the data. NN is the number of bytes, and N is the size minus the header. So it will tell you this in a second when it catches up. Um, but the size is, uh, minus the header being 11 is smaller than a small offset and a size of 11. I think the 11s are probably coincidence. But I'm very dubious about, ah, yay, we finally got somewhere. And I bet if I stretch that over, there we go. No, I wasn't making it up. So size leaf is the size of the leaf without the page index. And then it's the size in bytes, and that's the pointer to the data. So I'm a bit curious about this size leaf value. Um, not least of all, because if we look at this, the NN is 65,568, which always gets me a little bit cautious, because I know my powers of two. So what I'm going to do is let's find out where this value uh, was set. So I can use this again, go back. And I'm now even more anxious, because we're looking at unsigned 16s with powers of two, which are just a little bit over. So I think that this 11 is probably a problem. Um, let's have a look at the data. Um, this might be difficult for people to see at the back, so I'm sorry. I'll try and tell you, explain what's going on. Um, I'm just going to look at pret uh, p. So we're looking at the data, and we can see at offset 2, that's going to be that 0 and that 11. Is it untied in? That's 11. Um, so I'm very dubious about this 11. I want to know where that's come from. Um, what I can, I'm going to use the command line at the bottom, so I'll explain what I'm typing, and I'll make this thing a little bit bigger so maybe people can see as I do. Um, I want to know what was the last time p aret dash p three, which is the actual 11 value, changed. And we've gone back here, and we can see, yep, the value is 11. I had the right offset. Um, and we're in a mem copy. I'm going to assume memcopy works. I'm going to assume that I don't really care what happened to the destination. I want to go back to the source. So I'm going to do a little bit of funky maths here. So last, char star. Um, now I want the, uh, the source pointer, which is p payload. Um, and then my index into that is going to be this address minus long of the p buff. Um, and so I'm sorry for those who, if it's at the very bottom, you can't see at the back, but basically the, uh, the address of that 11 is in the p buff at the address of the breakpoint minus the address at the start of the buffer. So that gives my index in terms of characters. And I'm using that offset into the um, p payload to say this is the address that I care about. That should be the address of the 11 the first time. So let's go back and see where that came from. Good news is I've got the 11 again. Bad news is we've got to do the same thing. So this time I can uh, make it a little bit easier. Firstly, let's get the um, address. Oh, okay, I have to type it. Let's type it properly then. No shortcuts, not for today. So P cell, close brackets, open brackets, P minus long uh, P data. And we'll go back again, same again. Last, open brackets, char star. There, I wanted to do lots of typing in this demo, that's what's going on here. Um, P source. Okay, so let's get this address. Long of P payload. Hopefully this is making sense. I'm basically tracking backwards. I'm going to be very quick because I've just been to the sessions over. Um, another moment copy. Um, this is looking at P. Uh, no, this is... P, mem, z, open brackets. Buff. I'm going to get there. Ah, finally, we're there. We're at the point where we were doing the put U16, so this will be very quick. 
we can see we're storing the 11, but if I do reverse finish, you can see actually we're trying to store this pbuff.n and the value is 65,547. So we found where it got corrupted. Um, I'm going to be extra cheeky with your time and do it last on when that was last modified. And we can see at this point, we allowed it to go from 59,000 that would have fit in the U16 offset to 65,547 that doesn't. And we seem to have been comparing against this page size. So if we look at page size, that's 70,000. So last PGSZ. You can see where that came from. Okay, it came from a constant from the configuration. And then And here we are, we're setting it because we've requested it. We're checking that it's not less than zero and not greater than this max value. That max value is the um, issue here because we've allowed it to go over 64K. It shouldn't be allowed to go over 64K. That's where, that's 128K for those who can see it. Um, so we've range checked this, we've tried to set the page size and we've allowed it to go too big for what our data structure can actually implement. Um, rather than letting this go, because we're out of time, if I go back to the ticket, if we look at the timeline, we can see it was raised and there was a, a fix that was checked in. And if I look at the check-in fix, I did this because I wasn't sure the network Wi-Fi was going to work, so I've got the pages open. We can scroll down and see that that FTS5 max page size was 128 and the fix was to make it 64. So that has to be the most courageous live demo I've ever seen. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Hopefully you kept <laughs> that was uh, yeah, that was yeah, that was quite something. So like that was like how many? Three, four, five, following the corruption back all the way to the source. So I'm going to ask one more time: Who's going to go and try some kind of time travel debugging now? Have we changed anybody's mind? There we go. Pretty much every hand up. I think that was all for your demo. Thank you again, Chris. That was absolutely brilliant. Sorry, sorry that we ran over a little bit, but thank you.